Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to you. As many of you, in fact, probably all of you know, I'm Anne Greenoff and I'm Head of School of Medicine at King's College London. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this inaugural lecture. Inaugural lectures are given to celebrate the highest standards of academic excellence. This inaugural lecture will be given by Professor Kinya Otsu. Professor Otsu obtained his MD magna cum laude from Osaka University Medical School in 1983. He completed his clinical training in internal medicine at Osaka University Hospital. Since that time, his research and clinical interests have both focused on the treatment of heart failure. He began his scientific career at the National Institutes of Health in the United States and then worked at the University of Toronto and the University of Nice. Professor Otsu moved back to Japan as a senior resident in cardiology at the Osaka University Hospital and received his PhD uh, from Osaka University in 1992. He was appointed first as assistant professor in cardiology in Professor Hori's department at the Osaka University Medical School in 1997. And I'm delighted that Professor Hori is here uh, in the audience and will be saying a vote of thanks. He was then promoted to associate professor in 2002. And in 2012, we had the good fortune to recruit him to King's College London as professor of cardiology and he was awarded a British Heart Foundation Personal Chair of Cardiology. The main focus of his current research is on the roles of cardiomyocyte death and of inflammation in the pathogenesis of heart failure. His long-term goal is to identify new therapies and targets for the treatment of patients with heart failure. I'm delighted to now invite Professor Otsu to give his inaugural lecture entitled Preventing the Heart from Dying. Please. Oh, thank you very much uh, for kind of in introduction, uh, Professor Greenoff. And, uh, First of all, I would like to say I'm very pleased and proud to be here and to give you my inaugural lecture as a professor of King's College London. And I also appreciate all of you for coming uh, here for my lecture. And uh, in this evening, I will talk about my research regarding heart failure. And, uh, I was born in 1958 in Osaka, Japan. And uh, Japan, as you know, is uh, located on the other side of the continental. And uh, Osaka is located about the center of Japan, and this is the second largest city. I grew up here in Osaka, and I took a uh, usual course from uh, element, uh, kindergarten to uh, senior high school. Uh, during the elementary high school, I began to think that I want to be a doctor in the future because by reading uh, medical books or by actually seeing the doctors in the hospital, a doctor seems like to me a kind of a hero. So fortunately, I was be able to get in Osaka University Medical School and did a uh, resident in internal medicine. And uh, after completing a uh, residency in uh, Osaka University, I decided to be a cardiologist because for me, heart is a very dynamic organ. And uh, if to treat the patient with heart disease properly, the patient get well very obviously. However, if not, we lose patient life. And in addition, the cardiomyocyte is very mysterious to me. They beat, they still beat, up even after they isolate from the heart. And uh, as a disease, I am very much interested in heart failure because at the time, we have a very few treatment for heart failure and prognosis is very poor. 
So let me explain what is heart failure. So heart failure is a common and serious condition that develops slowly over time. Your heart becomes weakened and cannot pump enough blood to meet the demand of peripheral tissue. So heart, failing heart get dilated and they show a reduced wall contraction. And heart failure is caused by various cardiac diseases, including uh, coronary artery disease, uh, high blood pressure, valvular disease, myocarditis, dilated cardiomyopathy, or congenital heart disease. And heart failure patient shows uh, fatigue very easily and show shortness breath when they do exercise at the beginning. However, they uh, feel dyspnea even at rest at night later on. And uh, doctor diagnose heart failure by physical exam, blood test, X-ray, and ECG test, echocardiogram, or as an invasive test. And the patient was to, will be treated by doctor uh, by a uh, uh, suggestion of lifestyle changes, medication, surgery, nowadays by non-pharmacological therapies. And heart failure is more common in developed countries, including the UK. Heart failure is one of the leading causes for death. About half of people who have heart failure die within five years of diagnosis. One, of, one out of every five people at seven years old will develop heart failure in their lifetime. So heart failure is very common and very serious disease. And uh, how normal, heart, heart beats uh, uh, around 50, uh, 50 to 60 beats per minute, and uh, very regular beats. And in a cardiomyocyte, a cardi a myofibril is surrounded by reticular organella called sarcoplastic reticulum. And there is an invagination of sarcolemma into cytosol. It is called teachable. And interaction between teachable and uh, sarcoplastic reticulum is uh, very important for signal transduction from electrical, electrical a stimuli to a physical muscle contraction. The calcium plays an important role in muscle contraction and relaxation. So calcium gets into the cytosol through calcium channel in tubule. That calcium activates calcium root channel of uh, sarcoplastic reticulum. Uh, other name is ionic receptor. And the calcium then go out from sarcoplasm to cytosol and calcium activate actin myosin dynamics, thereby leading to muscle contraction. And calcium reuptake by calcium ATPs by in sarcoplastic reticulum, lower calcium concentration, and result in muscle relaxation. So since abnormalities in muscle contraction is a major feature of heart failure, uh, one can hypothesize calcium signaling is a major cause for heart failure. So I went to uh, Professor Mitch Tatarabadi to ask to work with him because he is the specialist for this award, award leading scientist in this world. He found Hosoramban, which is very important molecule to regulate calcium ATPs in sarcoplastic reticulum. But his answer is no, you cannot come to my laboratory. <laughs> Instead, he told me go to the United States to initiate my research career to be an uh, internationally recognized scientist in the future. So I decided to go to National Institute of Aging at NIH United States, where Professor A.J. Serra did postdoc later on. I work with uh, Jeffrey, Dr. Jeffrey Frederick. He invented a machine called rapid quenching machine. Using this machine, you can measure the first turnover of an enzyme reaction. And you can know the precise mechanism of an enzyme reaction. So we apply this theory to 
elucidate the molecular mechanism for sodium exchanger. This is a very important exchanger to maintain intracellular proton concentration. And we published several publications and found that a functional unit of sodium proton exchanger is oligomer and intracellular proton regulates organization, thereby regulates sodium calcium exchanger. And at the time, molecular biology techniques get into the uh, cardiovascular research world. However, there were very few laboratories which can conduct such a kind of uh, research in the world. One of them is now Professor Davis McLennan Laboratory in uh, University of Toronto. And I engage in a cloning of calcium root channel or cardiac uh, sarcolemma reticulum. And I, we, I, we are successfully cloned the protein uh, first in the world. And uh, we found in a uh, C-terminal uh, hydrophobic region formula channel in sarcoplastic reticulum and N-terminal hydrophilic region extend to teachable and play an play a important role to interaction between teachable and sarcoplastic reticulum. And the, it has been reported that there is a molecular defect in skeletal muscle from malignant hypersomnia. Malignant hypersomnia is genetic lethal disease. Malignant hypersomnia is characterized by abnormal response to administration of potent inhalation anesthetics, such as halosin. So once the patient develops the disease, the patient shows a high body temperature and the muscle contraction. So similar disease exists in pig. Upon uh, stress, pig develops the disease with like this muscle contracture and high temperature. For example, you put a pig into truck and transport from your farm to market. When you open the door of the truck at the market, you will see such a pig. And uh, all the pigs you know, uh, just stand on uh, four legs. Anyway, once the pig develops a disease, the meat becomes very watery and cannot be sold. This is a very big problem in the agricultural world at the time, especially in Canada and the UK. And the Junichi Fuji and I found the causal mutation for malignant hypersomnia in a skeletal type of calcium reduce channel, and we developed a diagnostic kit for the disease. So nowadays, we don't have any more malignant hypersomnia type of peak in this world. So we get a patent, but we get no money anymore. <laughs> and then I go to the University of Nice to work with Jack, Professor Jack Poisuga because he cloned the sodium proton exchanger. I would like to study the molecular nature of sodium proton exchanger by using my biochemical and molecular biological technique. But honestly speaking, Nice is too nice to work. <laughs> I enjoy food, beach, blue sky, and sea, but I could not any result for this period. <laughs> and I want to avoid, you know, spoil, I don't want, want to spoil my future, so I want to back to Japan, 1991. <laughs> so for basic research, I work in a Michiko laboratory, and my clinical work, I worked in Division of Cardiology, Department of Medicine, uh, where Chief in Cardiology was uh, Dr. Masatsuko Hori. He is in this audience. And uh, when he became a uh, professor of cardio Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, I was promoted to uh, assistant, then associate professor of medicine. And as I told you, uh, abnormalities in muscle contraction is a major feature of heart failure. So uh, reagent with inotropic character, which means uh, make heart strong, are uh, potentially useful to correct these anomalities. However, 
With the exception of Zigitaris, no inotropic agent has been associated with positive outcome. On the contract, beta blocker, which depressed cardiac function, improved the survival of heart failure patient. So we must change the concept of heart failure. Uh, by the way, uh, beta blocker is invented by Nobel uh, laureate uh, Sir James Black at King's College London, and my office, I use his office now. So I'm very happy, I'm very proud, and uh, it, I'm, I feel I'm right to come here. <laughs> and uh, as I told you uh, previously, uh, heart failure is characterized by impaired contractility and tissue con congestion, and we treat patients with gigitaris and diuretics. However, now uh, heart failure is characterized by abnormality in systemic circulation with abnormal activation of pneumofemoral factors and cytokines, such as angiotensin II, catecholamine, endocellin tumor necrosis factor. So we treat patients with a drug, angiotensin II combating uh, enzyme inhibitor, angiotensin II receptor antagonist, and beta blocker. So major question is how activation of pneumofemoral factors leads to heart failure. And if you see a uh, failing heart at very late stage, you can see a lot of vacuolation in cardiomyocyte and massive fibroblast. Uh, in other words, in a failing heart, cardiomyocytes are dying. And there are two modes of cell death. One is apoptosis, another one is ap uh, necrosis. Apoptosis is supposed to be active cell death, characterized by cell shrinkage, chromatin condensation, and nuclear fragmentation. On the other hand, necrosis is supposed to be a passive cell death, uh, characterized by cell swelling, plasma membrane disruption, and nuclear shrinkage. And you can observe apoptotic cardiomyocyte in failing heart indicate this uh, arrowhead. So apoptosis may, be play, may play an important role in genesis of heart failure. And apoptotic stimuli uh, uh, activate back back in the mitochondria. And cytochrome C in mitochondria is released from mitochondria, activate enzyme caspase. This is uh, this caspase executes apoptosis. And, uh, we, and uh, we, our question is how activation of pneumofemoral factors activate uh, this apoptotic signaling pathway. And uh, to, we decide we do this project to answer this question, but we realized that we must incorporate integrated biology in our research. Integrated biology include biochemistry, cell biology, molecular biology, gene targeting, and muscle physiology, all modern biological technique. So at the time, we don't have all technique, so my colleague, very excellent colleague, Nobushige Yamashita, attempt to establish mouse physiology. He is here at the audience. And my first graduate student, Kazuhiko Nishida, attempt to develop the technique, gene targeting technique. He is still working with me for 20 years. And uh, uh, you, you, uh, San Diego, uh, at the University of San Diego, Ken Chen and John Ross Jr. helped us uh, develop the technique a lot. And for me, uh, I tried to identify a target molecule to be examined and I collect money, research money, and I recruit a lot of students. And in general, ligand binding receptor, this, this is activate, uh, increase in a second messenger in a cell. And this second messenger activate MAP, MAP kinase cascade, uh, consists of MAP3 kinase, 2 kinase, MAP kinase. And this cascade activate transcriptional factors and enhance gene expression. In cardio mass, cardiac muscle, angiotensin II increase in calcium in cytosol, and this calcium works as a second messenger here. The calcium activate MAP, 
uh, map kinetics cascade constituting RAF1, MEK, MKK12, and ARC1. And they activate the transcriptional factor AP1. At this time, new class of uh, P, uh, map kinetics, namely JNK and P38, have been reported. And these kinetics are activated ultraviolet radiation, reactive oxygen species, ROS, and osmotic shock. But in cardiac muscle, upstream or downstream signaling cascade of P38 JNK remain to be elucidated. And reactive oxygen species is known in mitochondria. Mitochondria consists of two membrane system, outer membrane and inner membrane. And the uh, electron transport chain uh, located in the uh, inner mitochondrial membrane uh, generate electrochemical gradient across inner mitochondrial membrane of proton uh, by transferring uh, electron and using uh, oxygen. And using this electrochemical gradient, um, this uh, electrotransport chain can produce ATP. This is the energy source for us. But mitochondria is get damaged, like in failing heart, you can see mitochondria swelling and intramitochondria damaged. These are mitochondria. From these mitochondria, ROS are leaked out from the electrotransport system. And this ROS directly damage macromolecules such as uh, protein lipid DNA, resulting in uh, organic damage and cell death. And in heart failure or ischemia reperfusion, this ROS induced cell death play a very important role. And uh, when you subject the heart in, uh, to ischemia followed by reperfusion, you get the uh, infarct shown in white here. And uh, in a heart, there is a cardioprotective mechanism against ischemia reperfusion injury. It's called pre, uh, ischemic preconditioning. And uh, if you subject a uh, very brief period of subresal ischemia, heart get cardioprotection against subsequent lethal ischemia. And uh, we and uh, Mike Marber found uh, that pre time course of preconditioning are biphasic. And the preconditioning, the preconditioning appear just after sublethal stress and then disappear and reappear 24 to 48 hours after stress. And Nobu found that not only ischemia, but also some other stress, like exercise hypersomia, LPS, can also induce cardioprotection against ischemia reperfusion injury. In other words, if you want uh, to decrease your myo-infarct size on cardiac heart attack, you do exercise every 24 hours, or you take a hot bath every 48 hours, or if you get a catch a cold, you don't have to any, do anything. <laughs> Bacteria give you a cardio protection. <laughs> and uh, uh, Nobu and I tried to elucidate the molecular mechanism underlying uh, this subresal induced cardio protection. And we found subresal stress induced uh, the generation of ROS. This ROS. Or uh, induce pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF and IL-1 beta. And this cytokine activates manganese superoxidismutase. This is very strong antioxidant. And important message is reactive oxygen species work as a second messenger in this system. So we hypothesize ROS work as a second messenger in failing heart too. And uh, my graduate student, Shinichi Hirotani, examined whether pneumofenolar factor can generate ROS in cardiomyocyte. So he isolated cardiomyocyte and load uh, ROS sensitive dye and incubate with pneumofenolar factors such as angiotensin II, endocerin, and uh, phenylephrine. And he found generation of uh, ROS 
by numerical factors. And for an in vitro study, graduate student Motoro Date uh, subject the mice to uh, ischem uh, pressure overload by means of a transverse aortic constriction. We use, uh, often call this technique as TAC. And this is TAC operated mouse. He observed an upper regulation of MDA. MDA is a marker for ROS. So in vivo and in vitro study, that numerical factors or fresh uh, stress induced generation of ROS. So next question is, what is the MAP3 kinase downstream of ROS? So we look it for, look for uh, in the literature, uh, we found that uh, MAP3 kinase called apoptosis signal regulating kinase 1, ASK1. This kinase is an ROS sensitive and active JNK and leading to apoptosis. So, Shinichi examined whether ASK1 is activated by pneumofemoral factors. And this band represents ASK1 activity. You can, as you can see, these cytokine, uh, these pneumofemoral factors activate ASK1. And pre treatment of an antioxidant attenuate the uh, ASK1 activation, suggesting uh, ASK1 activate in ROS dependent manner by pneumofemoral factors. And the uh, next question is, what are the transcurrential factors downstream of ASK1? And we again look for in the literature, and we found NH-kappa B. NH-kappa B is known to be ROS dependent and play an important role for cytokine production. And CNH again observe NH-kappa B activation by pneumofemoral factors. And this activation was inhibited by a dominant negative form, uh, which can inhibit the ASK1 activation, uh, or inhibit the kappa B activation, and constitutively active mutant of ASK1 induce ASK1 activation. So these data indicate uh, kappa B exists downstream of uh, ASK1. So we continue this kind of research and we find out the molecular mechanism, this one. And uh, this is just in vivo study, an uh, in vitro study. Next, we try to the role of this novel uh, ROS sensitive signaling pathway in failing heart. And uh, Osamu Yamaguchi and Yoshiharu Higuchi subject ASK1 knockout mice to pressure overload or myocardial infarction. And Osamu is here in this audience. And uh, wild type man shows uh, chamber dilatation and cardiac dysfunction four weeks after attack. And uh, uh, for uh, myocardial infarct, wild type man shows uh, also chamber dilatation with cardiac dysfunction. However, ASK1 mice did not develop cardiomyopathy against the pressure overload, nor coronary ligation. And we estimate uh, apoptosis, and uh, this blue bar represents uh, a wild type, red bar represents a scale of knockout mice. In wild type mice, you can see increase in apoptosis, cardi apoptotic cardiomyocyte cell number. However, in a knockout mice, the number is significantly attenuated. So, lethal stress such as pressure overload or uh, ischemia activate ASK1, leading to apoptosis and necrosis. And uh, we next try to identify the role of P38 in failing heart. But unfortunately, P38 knockout mouse is an uh, embolic lethal. So, Kaz Nishida uh, established two lines of mice. One is transgenic mice of clear recombinants under the control of alpha MHC promoter, which is a cardiac myocyte specific promoter. And another one is a ROX P38 mice, and he put two ROX sequence down upstream and downstream of P38 gene. And clear recombinants can cut out the gene between two ROX sites. So if you uh, cross two mice, you can get cardiac-specific P38 knockout mice. 
and he subjected this mice to pressure overload, and he observed one week after pressure overload. And control, control mouse does not show any heart failure. However, P38 knockout mouse shows heart failure, so suggesting P38 shows cardioprotective effect against pressure overload. And uh, uh, Shungo Hikoso next examined a role of NNO kappa B, and he using an NNO kappa B knockout mice, he e tried to elucidate the role. And we estimate the cardiac function using by echocardiography, and you put transducer on a chest wall and get an uh, image. And this is a typical image, and uh, this is a mode echo, y axis. Uh, represent uh, depth of echo generating interface, and uh, x-axis represent time. And uh, uh, TAC operated NL kappa B, the uh, deficient mouse shows the chamber dilatation and the cardiac dysfunction, suggesting NL kappa B also uh, play a cardioprotective effect against pressure overload. And we continue this kind of research and uh, we found lethal stress uh, lead to generation of ROS. This activates ASK1 JNK signaling pathway leading to apoptosis. On the other hand, lethal stress activate protective signaling pathway, including RAF1, kappa B, P38, and Calpine. And uh, this ba balance between a prototic signal pathway and a protective cardiac pathway will determine the cell fate, or whether heart develop heart failure or not. And uh, you can imagine now here is K1 might be a therapeutic target to treat a patient with heart failure. But we, we, know, we show you knockout mice did not develop uh, heart failure upon pressure overload. However, this, is, this does not mimic the clinical setting because at clinical setting, you treat the patient only after patient shows the disease. So we use the TO2 hamster. This hamster developed spontaneously cardiomyopathy and we infected adenal stress vector expressing uh, dominant negative mutant of SK1 after the hamster shows cardiac dysfunction. And uh, Tokushiro Takeda and Shun, Shungo and Osamu found inhibition of SK1 activity lead to an attenuation of heart failure. So SK1 might be very good therapeutic target to treat patient. Now, uh, in collaboration with pharmaceutical company, we are developing a small molecule which inhibits ASK1. <laughs> and uh, during this research, we found that the one single molecule, a uh, signaling molecule, has dual effect. One is detrimental effect, and another one is uh, protective effect. For example, we examine a low of P38 mass in various cell type and various stimuli. And sometimes, uh, sometimes the P38 shows cardio, uh, cell protective, but sometimes shows detrimental effect, depend on the cell type, depend on the stimuli. So we must be very careful if we target the signaling molecule, we must define very clearly cell type and uh, stress. And uh, as, I as I told you, necrosis is supposed to be in a passive cell death. So if necrosis is passive cell death, we cannot regulate this cell death. And uh, myocardial in, fact, in myocardial, in fact, necrosis is a major feature of cell death. But, you know, we cannot regulate. It's a very disappointing. So we, the, we examine the necrotic mechanism very, uh, very in detail. So we found that necrosis is not passive cell death, but active cell death. Uh, mitochondrial permeability transition, uh, here, my, uh, mitochondrial permeability transition power, PTP is uh, responsible for necrosis. 
necrotic stimuli activate this PTP pore, opening this pore dissipate electrochemical gradient across inter inner mitochondrial membrane, leading to decrease in ATP, thereby necrotic cell death. So, and cyclohelin D is a very important subunit of permeability trans uh, transition pore. So we made a cytochelin D knockout mice and subject to ischemia reperfusion injury. This study was done, Tetsuya Watanabe, a uh, graduate student. And control mice, you can see now here, a myocardial infarct. But surprisingly, cyclohelin D knockout mice, you cannot find any myocardial infarct. So even myocardial infarct necrosis, we can control. So if we know the precise role for a uh, precise uh, molecular mechanism toward necrosis, we can, we may uh, treat a patient with a myocardial infarct. And uh, recently, third type of cell death are reported called autophagic cell death. What is autophagy? Autophagy is known to uh, as a adaptive response for starvation. Upon starvation, cytoplasmic material or organella, including mitochondria, secreted by isolation membrane to form double membrane vacuole autophagosome. Autophagosome then undergoes fusion with lysosome to form autolysosome. And uh, there are many degraded uh, enzymes in my, uh, lysosomes and degradation of contents in autolysosome or gelate amino acid and fatty acid. They can be reused by the cell for protein synthesis and for generation of ATP. In other words, if you get hungry, just you eat your arm and you, you are, you know, full. Such a kind of a mechanism. And uh, many studies have been done to elucidate the role of autophagy. And this is a summary slide. There are two kinds of autophagy. One is constitutive autophagy, another one is inducible autophagy. Uh, constitutive autophagy is very important uh, intracellular clearance, in other words, make cell clean. And uh, inducible autophagy, this is activated by starvation. This is important for nutrient regulation. And uh, we found autophagosome or autolysome structure in fail human failing heart. And uh, Atsuko Nakai with uh, Osamu tried to elucidate the role of autophagy in failing heart. They made uh, ATG5 cardiac specific ATG5 deficient mice. ATG5 is an you know, important molecule for formation of autophagosome. And they subject this mice to pressure overload. Uh, one week after pressure overload, control mass, control mass did not show any cardiac dysfunction. However, ATG5 deficient mouse shows cardiac dysfunction. And ATG5 knockout mouse shows uh, disalignment of mitochondria and intramitochondrial con uh, structure is severely damaged, suggesting autophagy is not related to cell death. Autophagy is a protective mechanism. And uh, there is two kind of uh, protein degradation system in the cell. One is autophagy, as I told you. Another one is ubiquitin proteosome, proteosome system. This is very selective degradation system. Uh, the damaged protein is ubiquitinated, and the ubiquitinated damaged protein is degraded by proteasome. And uh, we analyzed the ATG5 knockout mice. Uh, this is pressure overload knockout mass here. You can see a lot of ubiquitinated protein. And uh, this is now we estimate the uh, apoptotic cell number. So pressure overloaded ATG5 deficient mass shows increase in uh, auto, uh, apoptosis. So uh, our conclusion is if uh, under stress, uh, the smaller amount of uh, damaged proteins accumulate in a cell, the, that protein is tried to repair by uh, heat shock protein. But if you get a more degraded protein, this protein is regulated by ubiquitin proteasome system. And if you must further increase in amount of degraded protein, these proteins are degraded by autophagy to make inside cell clean. However, 
if you get an insufficient autophagy activity, uh, aggregate protein induced in apoptosis. And uh, regarding the role of autophagy in the heart, also they have, there, is two, there are two kinds of autophagy. One is constitutive autophagy, another one is inducible autophagy. Constitutive autophagy is important for protein or organelle quality control, whereas inducible autophagy is protects heart against pressure or uh, lethal stress like pressure overload. And uh, it is well known damaged mitochondria or protein are accumulated in aged cell. And Manabu Taneikyo, he worked, he moved from Japan to, uh, with me. Uh, he found the autophagic activity in the heart is downregulated during aging. And he observed the ATG5 knockout mass for a longer time. And you can see these are very damaged and corrupted mitochondria in the heart. This mitochondria can generate ROS leading to the cardiac function and the heart failure. It might be one, one of the mechanisms why we see more patients in aged population. And uh, in the old days, we are fighting acute disease such as infection or bleeding. Nowadays, we are fighting against chronic disease such as uh, obesity, diabetes, medicine, uh, ischemic heart disease, stroke, cancer, neurogenerative disease, autoimmune disease. And there has been reported inflammation play an important role in the genesis of this kind of chronic disease. Uh, for heart failure, also inflammation is supposed to play an important role for the uh, pathogenesis. However, major uh, big question is how our inflammation is triggered because we don't see any microorganism such as bacteria or virus in the organ. So we focused mitochondria because mitochondria is known to derive from bacteria. Uh, all days, uh, ancestral eukaryote engulf uh, ancestral prokaryotes like bacteria. Over time, uh, this bacteria evolved into mitochondria. And nowadays, we use uh, mitochondria as an energy producing uh, apparatus. And uh, on the other hand, mitochondria use us a uh, protein or DNA supplier. But since um, mitochondria derived from bacteria, they still has the character of bacteria. Uh, they are DNA contain unmesed CPG motif. This is strongly induced inflammation. So graduate student Takafumi Oka hypothesized that mechanical load induce or increase in damage to mitochondria and insufficient induction of autophagy lead to accumulation of the mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA lead to inflammation and heart failure. So first, he observed the heart section in failing heart, whether DNA is accumulated there. And he stayed in the heart section, pygoglin, this is marker for DNA, anti-LAMP2A, this is marker for lysosome, and anti-LC3, this is marker for autophagosome, autolysosome. And uh, you can see pygoglin, LAMP2A positive dot, as well as pygoglin and LC3 positive dot. This indicates DNA is accumulated in autolysosome or autophagosome in failing heart. And uh, to know the role of DNA accumulation, he generated cardiac-specific DNA2 knockout mice. DNA2 loc uh, localizing lysosome and they can degrade DNA. And he subjected this mice to the pressure overload by means of TAC. So 10 days after attack, the knockout man shows chamber dilatation and cardiac dysfunction. So DNS2 is very important to protect heart against pressure overload. And he examined the inflammatory response. Uh, this column shows uh, pressure overload uh, DNS knockout mass. You can see infiltration of inflammatory cells, including macrophage and neutrophil. And then this is electron microscopical analysis. 
Uh, this is TAC operator DNA through knockout mice. You can see this is mitochondria. Intramitochondria structure is severely damaged. And you can see some electron dense deposit. If you observe this structure very carefully, this is look like mitochondria in autolysome. So next question is, so DNA, mitochondria DNA is accumulated in failing heart. So how this DNA induce inflammation? And uh, so we can go back to bacteria world because mitochondria derived from bacteria. So bacteria DNA invaded to the cell and this uh, bacteria DNA is recognized by toll-like receptor 9. And the activation of TL9 induces the inflammation. So we hypothesize mitochondrial DNA uh, induced inflammation is this same way. And we uh, treat a uh, TL9 inhibitor to a uh, DNA knockout mice. This is control drug. This is in TL9 inhibitor drug. Control drug, you can see an inflammatory response. However, inhibitor can reduce an inflammatory response. So uh, mitochondria DNA induce inflammation in TL9 dependent manner in DNA to knockout mice. So next question, this is true for the mice with DNA too. So we subject TL9 knockout mice to pressure overload. So 10 weeks after pressure overload, control mouse shows heart failure. However, very surprisingly, TL9 knockout mice did not develop heart failure. And this is wild mice data. After we subject wild mice to the pressure overload, and TL9 inhibitor improves survival of the mice. So DNA TL9 signaling play an important role in the pathogenesis of heart failure, and this signaling pathway might be a therapeutic target to treat patient with heart failure. So summary. Uh, Pressure overload damaged mitochondria. This mitochondria is sequestrated by autophagy system. However, insufficient uh, level of autophagy resulting in accumulation of mitochondria DNA. This mitochondria DNA activated TL9 are resulting in uh, production of cytokine. Cytokine then go out from the cell and recruit macrophage and neutrophil uh, and uh, enhanced uh, enhanced inflammation. That enhanced inflammation uh, gives you damage of card to cardiomyocyte. So in this talk, I show you the cell death is very important for the genesis of heart failure. And we, I want to uh, propose that cardiomyocyte uh, heart failure as uh, cardiomyocyte deficient, deficient syndrome. And the last topic I want to talk about, uh, heart failure, as you said, that imbalance between oxygen supply and oxygen demand. So we try to correct the normality in the heart, but if we can increase the hydrogen availability in peripheral tissue, that might be good therapy. So oxygen binds to hemoglobin in red blood cell in a lung. This carried out to the peripheral tissue, and oxygen is released from hemoglobin. And this is crocodile. Crocodile can live in the water for a long time, even for days. Why? Their hemoglobin easily releases a high oxygen in the peripheral tissue. So we generate mice, which has crocodile type of hemoglobin. <laughs> and, uh, and, mice, and we subject the mice to a myocardial infarct. As you see, heart does not move. Very, very reduced cardiac function. And this is a mice, which has a mice type of hemoglobin. This is a mice, which has a crocodile type of hemoglobin. And let me see. So this is treadmill. So this is belt, com belt is moving from left to uh, right to left. So mice does not, cannot run this kind of speed. And this is crocodile. So don't surprise. 
<laughs> they can run. So we don't need mouse con uh, heart contraction. We just need an oxygen in peripheral tissue. And there is some uh, molecule called RSR. This molecule lowers uh, oxygen affinity for uh, affin oxygen affinity. And uh, we administer this molecule to the mice, heart failure mice, and uh, examine the running distance. And blue bar, this is control. This uh, red bar represents uh, RSR, treat, certain treated mice. And control mouse getting tired and running distance decrease. Whereas RSR 13 mice run at constant forever. Uh, forever is not a science, that science word. <laughs> anyway, today's talk, I uh, talk to you mitochondria regulates life and uh, death. And uh, mitochondria is very important for gen energy uh, generation. However, mitochondria get damaged. Uh, ROS leak out from uh, mitochondria that uh, influence inflammation, reduce signaling, leading to cell death and heart failure. Autophagy tried to clean, uh, generate the damage to mitochondria. And if we can uh, hold this mechanism, we may find a very novel and effective therapeutics to heart failure patient. And uh, we move from Japan to England uh, one, one year and uh, four months ago, and uh, we had uh, three postdocs and two wife and two kids. <laughs> now we have uh, we join all girls and we have uh, nine people, and uh, one kid uh, increase. <laughs> and finally, I would like to appreciate all the collaborators and also funding agency like uh, Japanese government. Uh, this is the uh, uh, Ministry for Science. This is the Ministry of Health. And JSPS, this is the Japan Society for Promotion of Science. And uh, our first secretary uh, for uh, science and welfare in uh, Embassy Japan in King United Kingdom is uh, in this audience also. Uh, head of uh, JSPS in London office is here. Thank you. And also, uh, British Hathaway Foundation uh, support us a lot. Uh, Professor uh, Peter Weisberg is here in this audience. And uh, I would like to give uh, many thanks uh, to my mentor, Professor Michi Tada, David McLennan, and Dr. Jeff Frederick, and Professor Hori, uh, Professor Hori. And uh, I appreciate my graduate student. I had a uh, privilege to work with. They are very hardworking and talented student. And they didn't have any experience for science at the beginning, but they can, they can get publication in high impact score only for a couple of years. And uh, I appreciate King's College London, especially Professor A.J. Shah. Uh, who gave me an opportunity to work here. And uh, I appreciate for uh, British Heart Foundation. British Heart Foundation gave me an uh, uh, award me a uh, chair grant and a uh, program grant, which make it possible for me to work here. And finally, I appreciate very much to my family. They always support me what I want to do. And uh, this is last, last slide. As you may know, this year is a 400 years anniversary. First, Britain and Japan has official contact. And James, uh, King James I wrote a letter to Shogun Ieyasu. And Shogun Ieyasu replied a letter to uh, King James I. He said, though separated by 10,000 leagues of crowds, uh, crowds and waves, our territories are as it were close to each other. I feel the same thing. Thank you very much for your attention.
And I call on Professor Shah, uh, who is head of division and head of the British Heart Foundation Centre of Excellence, to give the first vote of thanks. Thank you. Uh, well, it's really a pleasure and a privilege for me to uh, deliver the vote of thanks. Um, actually, um, I would like to deliver three votes of thanks. <coughs> uh, the first vote of thanks is for, I'm sure everyone will agree, an outstanding lecture and a real uh, demonstration of state-of-the-art science pursuing questions using a range of different techniques and showing us data that really uh, promises potentially to deliver new therapies for patients with heart failure. So I'm sure that this has been uh, an absolute inspiration, uh, particularly to those uh, younger scientists uh, and PIs in the audience. So that's my first vote of thanks. My second vote of thanks uh, is to Kenya for leaving Japan at a, uh, I would say, well-established stage in his career and coming to join us here at King's. Uh, in the short time that he has been here, he has already made uh, many significant achievements. We heard about his BHF chair, uh, has brought in substantial sums of money in grant funding from the BHF and the MRC, published uh, many uh, high impact articles, and most recently played an important role in allowing us to obtain renewal of our BHF Center of Excellence. So that's my second vote of thanks. I have a third one. The third one is to Kenya, and not just Kenya, but also the rest of your team for embracing the spirit of Anglo-Japanese uh, collaboration and friendship, uh, because it gives me great pleasure to tell you that Kenya and his team have completely embraced not only the scientific interactions within the department, but also social and other interactions. Uh, so that's very good to see. So can I invite the audience, please, to join me in uh, thanking uh, Kenya. Uh, I'm now going to call on Professor Hori to also give a vote of thanks. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. Uh, as a mentor of the Professor Otsu, I am uh, delighted and a great honor to thank, uh, first of all, uh, Professor Shar and distinguished members of the King's College uh, London for his appointment uh, British Heart Foundation's Chair and Professor of the Cardiology. Uh, he graduated Osaka University, as myself, uh, with magna cum laude, and he received the uh, Kusumoto Award. And Professor Kusumoto is a founder of internal medicine, Osaka University, more than 100 years ago. And after two years residency, he started research work at first uh, NIH, and second, University of Toronto, and third, although it's a very short stay, but University of Nice, as suggested uh, the mentor, Michi Tada. And he get a really international scientist. And as in his seminar, his first work is the cloning of the uh, uh, gene for the malignant hyperthermia. And after that, he engaged in the biological and molecular biology for the calcium regulations. And when he came back to Japan, our department, Osaka University, 1997, uh, that year, I 
had a get position of a professorship over a department. And he got a position of a faculty member. He started the molecular biology and heart failure, as you uh, learned from his seminar. And during this course, he has been always respected by his colleagues for his sincerity and honesty and enthusiasm. There is no question that he is a leading scientist in the world in this cardiovascular science. And I am very proud of that. He is always present with smile. And he enjoyed his life with humor, although it is very strict in the science. <laughs> his enthusiasm or dedication to his uh, very hard work is superb. And I believe that he will greatly contribute to the King's College London with his outstanding research work. So congratulations again. And I'd like to say uh, many thanks for his appointment at the professorship, especially for the distinguished members of the King's College London, as well as his family and his colleagues and friends. Thank you very much, and again, congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you'll agree, we've had a superb lecture. So now let's go and celebrate further. There is a reception in the foyer.